Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Impact Farming Show. On today's episode, we have an amazing guest, Diane Finstad. I am about to interview a media legend here. Welcome. Oh, thanks. That sounds a little intimidating. I hope it's not that way. <laughs> Every word of it is true. So for the one or two people that don't know who you are, I'm going to try and give a Coles Notes version of your accomplishment. So you were a reporter in agriculture and rodeo circuits. You were an award-winning host of two shows. You were a freelance writer. And you also, as many people know you, you covered rodeo events across North America. NFR, CFR, the Calgary Stampede. I know I have watched your lovely face countless times on TV and it's just so cool to be seen across from you. Well, it's a thrill to be here. It's kind of, uh, you know, once you've been around for so long, it's nice when people still uh, remember and, and look back and uh, remember things fondly. So the ones that always say, well, I watched you when I was really little and now they're all grown up. Then you think, oh, have I been around that long? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I know you are so humble and I told a few people that I'm going to be interviewing you. And they're like, oh my gosh, Diane Finson. Oh no. Yeah. So yeah, there's You're a lot of pressure. Blush. There's a lot of pressure here. So I want to give our audience the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. You were always the one covering the farmers and their story and the rodeo stars and their story. So I want to dive into who Diane is. So can you tell us a little bit more about you? I can tell you that's a different perspective because, you know, when you are the one asking the questions for so long, it really gives you a new um, appreciation uh, for what your subjects, you know, are thinking about or going through when you're the one being asked the question, so it's kind of different. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was blessed to have grown up in a, a rural atmosphere, um, kind of, uh, you know, we thought we were right in the center of where things were happening, but I guess a lot of people would kind of stay in the middle of nowhere. Um, the nearest uh, town to where our ranch is is a little place called Manyberries, which most okay. people haven't heard of. And we had to travel 25 miles to get to school in Manyberries. And Manyberries is south of uh, Medicine Hat. So okay. our ranch okay. is about 15 miles from the border across country. And so we just thought it was natural that you you know, had neighbors two to three miles away and had to travel half an hour to get anywhere. and. You know, that was just a part of life. And I think you really learn to build community that way and yeah. share rides and all those kinds of things. And, and you learn to appreciate your surroundings. And I know, you know, when I did move to Red Deer, where I spent most of my career, I couldn't believe how close everyone lived, it, you know, because the land is so much more <laughs> productive. They live on quarter sections and it's like, your neighbor's right there. How yeah. Do you, yeah, cope with that. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, our family is a uh, fourth generation ranch uh, and uh, we do have some grain as well but mainly to feed the cattle and um, cattle have been uh, what's enabled our family uh, to uh, stay in that area when a lot of people were dried out in the dirty 30s and, and move on so okay. ranching was always important the cattle were great 4-H uh, and all that sports uh, those are all things that okay. I really treasured from my childhood growing up which I think sort of set the stage for where I ended up in my career and, and gave me that uh, leg up in terms of knowing how to relate to farmers and people in small communities. 4-H is a big one. Yeah, I'm a 4-H'er myself. So anytime somebody speaks about 4-H, I just, I just praise that one. So I would love to know, I'm trying to dive into the making of Diane here. So did you, did you have a strong interest in rodeo when you were younger? Sure, everyone in the area did. Uh, okay. There was uh, a little rodeo grounds nearby called uh, Riding on Stone, which is a sort of a provincial park, and they had a riding and roping club. And you know, my dad was kind of a member and, and uh, did a little roping. And my neighbors to the south, uh, he was a, a, ended up being a pro roper, and, and so oh, wow. that was you know our entertainment. We'd go out and, and uh, you know play cowboys or, or whatever. That's that was all part of it. And my grandpa would take us to the Medicine Hat Stampede every year from okay. since before. I could remember and you know it's funny now looking back I probably have some programs from the Medicine Hat Stampede because I'm a 
saver uh, that uh, <laughs> that I was keeping track of scores and everything back then. I don't know why, but you know, it was something that seemed to be important at the time. So. Okay. And then, yeah, we went to rodeos a lot. I never did compete. People often ask me about that, and I can remember. Uh, a, you know, a chat with my dad, and and we had a good neighbor, um, a, a, the famous cat broker Marty Becker. His mom lived just south of us, and and uh, she barrel raced. And so he said, "Well, do you want to do barrel racing, or do you want to do 4-H?" You kind of had the choice. And okay, as a family, we talked about it, and we said, "Well." You know, rodeo is a lot of weekends, and, that, and oh. the whole family can be involved in 4-H. And so that was the path we chose as a family, and okay. that's the path that ended up leading me back to rodeo. So it's kind of interesting how things work out. Oh, interesting. So I am curious how you got into broadcasting. Can you talk about that journey a little bit? So let's go back to 4-H okay. because I was involved in public speaking and like every 10-year-old 4-H member, knees were quaking. Shaking and, yeah, in your boots. And oh, I remember. Encouragement from senior members and uh, I found out that that was something that I kind of liked and, and, and uh, enjoyed my 4-H public speaking career. Okay. And at that time, there was even a, a program called 4-H Club Time. There's a memory uh, mm. <laughs> a twigger for a lot of people. Uh, and so we had a seminar. We got to go up to Edmonton and see where it was produced. And, and, okay. uh, and then I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And so then when I was looking around at um, opportunities for after high school and I saw something about radio arts, that just sort of seemed to be something that I was interested in. And so I went to college in Lethbridge and took my formal training was in, in radio and, and uh, that program. That makes sense. Okay. I wondered, as soon as you said 4-H, the pieces started mm -hmm. clicking together yeah. in my head. I said, okay, public speaking yes. and then broadcasting, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you obviously stuck through the shaking in the boots yes. and all of that. Yeah. 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 I remember back in the day, a lot of people fell off and out of 4-H because of that. They just hated it it's so much. Too bad, and I guess I was fortunate we had good leaders that, that encouraged us and, yeah. and made public speaking uh, fun and, and something that we had to do because that's one of the greatest things you can come out of 4-H with because totally. it's a life skill that's gonna serve you well everywhere and you hear time and time again from potential employers, 4-H kids that know how to handle responsibility and to speak and communicate are the ones that they're gonna pick first. Absolutely. Okay, so that is fantastic. Can you share a little bit about your broadcasting career? Yeah, so uh, at college I was known as the country kid and okay. then I, I got a, a job in news out of college in a, a small town near us, uh, Tabor, and was uh, you know hard at work there. I'd only been in the job about three months and then at uh, my college uh, instructor got a call from Red Deer and they were okay. uh, looking for someone to do agriculture news for their station. They'd had a few people who hadn't stuck around, maybe they didn't have ag backgrounds okay. and so they knew I had an ag background and so they sent them my way. Excellent. So that's kind of how I got hooked up there. Okay. And then your career just progressed from there? Well, you know, lots of changes. I think that's the one constant that you get used to in, in even back then and the changes weren't revol as revolutionary as they are now but uh, broadcasting there was always lots of changes you okay. know we had uh, five ownership changes in four years and different um, people in charge and um, you know you just you had to learn to adapt into wow. whatever a lesson was out there and I can remember one of my teachers at college saying you know uh, it's if you're going to specialize in something you kind of need to be adept at it and and she used the um, uh, example of uh, Rick uh, Swihart at the Lethbridge, a longtime ag reporter at the Lethbridge Herald, and how he fit into so many different areas. So I knew that if I wanted to specialize in agriculture, it was good to. I had the radio, TV, I learned on the job, and um, good to be able to learn how to write. And, and I never did kind of do the shooting a lot. I, I can take still pictures somewhat, but I never did learn the video part. I was sort of uh, before the era of videographers uh, in terms of my training, but you okay. know, to, to develop all of those skills kind of makes you a little more uh, able to plug into whatever the need is out there for communication, so. That makes sense. And wow, I mean, getting used to change. Everybody tends to resist change, but even I think the nature of being a reporter, you're on the go and you're working on the fly and talking to people and you don't know what they're gonna say. I think that would make you a little bit more comfortable with change than the next person, right? Uh, yeah, uh, and that, and again, that's something that the job skill that you sort of have to pick up. But you know, I go back to my farm roots and uh, when we had to go out and check cows and uh, I think I had a little, <laughs> 
Honda Trail 90 that we ch they checked one big pasture and others on horseback. But you know, you had to be observant, right? You had to look at what's around. And if you, you saw a cow that something wasn't right, you had to be able to explain where that cow was. And so, you know, that attention True. to detail and observing and, you know, if you're driving the baler and something goes wrong, you know, and, and how to handle when situations go wrong. And so all those things that I learned just yeah. in the experience of working on the farm really served me well, I think, in reporting and then in, in other areas areas as well. That's very neat. That's so true. You don't even think of those skills about checking animals, right? You do. You have to be very observant. Yeah, yeah. You look at a pen of calves and you're looking for the droopy ears, the signs that they're off, right? And it's a, you're being a reporter then. You know, it's, it's you those the skills are. of observation and then analyzing it and drawing conclusions. So. Interesting. Very neat. Okay, so you were the host of two award-winning shows. Can you talk to me and tell me a little bit more about those shows? So when I first started at Red Deer, there was a weekly program called This Business of Farming. And uh, so I did half an hour of TV every week. And so that often meant bringing guests into the studio, much as we're doing, and, okay. and visiting with them. It would include stories that had we done during the week and that sort of thing. So, you know, it started out pretty elementary at the beginning. And I smile because I still have people come on. And they were very patient with me at the very beginning when I was learning. You know, they, oh, you've come so far. <laughs> and you think, oh boy, how bad was I at the beginning? Uh, but uh, then uh, you, you just learn as you go and so then uh, that one ended up being a daily program just as ownership changes came along and so we okay. were producing half an hour of content every day at the station. Oh, wow. We would tape it the night before and it would air early the next morning. And so that would include some prices, uh, some market reports, uh, especially more in the early days and then interviews and features and uh, wherever we could find news stories to fill half an hour. So wow. it, it was a lot of work. That is. And then at some point in the career I was doing half an hour daily and then co-anchoring the news too. So that, you know, was that push and pull of, of where my passion was an egg and I knew that, but yet to survive in the news business, you kind of had to be able to do both. Okay. So, and that was valuable uh, training as well. But uh, yeah, so that, and then the, the program did change its name over the years, but uh, for most of my years, I, I did have a, you know, an ag program at the TV station, so. Oh, that's neat. Now, rodeo coverage. I'm a rodeo fan and I know many of our audience are as well. I think when you are in rural Canada, farming communities, rural US, I mean we don't only have Canadians watching, rodeo seems to be one of those things that's part of the community just like you said and I know you are much loved in that community and so many people have watched your coverage of these events. I can imagine you've just met some amazing people and heard great stories. And I think that goes back to rodeo's roots. You know, really, rodeo is is uh, making a competition out of things that um, ranchers would do on an ordinary basis. You know, yes. how fast could you catch the calf in the field and my horse is better than yours? Or can you stay on a bronc that's out of control? And, and sure. now they're quite a ways away from that in, in a lot of situations, but they are still, um, you know, ranch-based events. And so the people are very real. And I always think it's interesting when I would cover the Calgary Stampede and you'd have hockey reporters that only had to cover rodeo, say, once a year and they would just be amazed at how fresh and what good storytellers these contestants were and it gave us a new appreciation for it because we knew that they they can say things in fewer words and it's it's fresh every time and they just give you their perspective as, as they see it uh, so that that always was great and, and just the, the champion stories I often go back to somebody like a Dwayne Danes who um, was such an icon and then um, you know had the accident and yeah. yeah has carried on so much from a wheelchair and done so much, carried on as an auctioneering, um, and is quietly a mentor to so many in a similar situation, and then has got a great uh, way of describing events, and so I get to work with him at the Canadian Finals Rodeo with, when he does commentating. So just to see the progression of those people and, and, you know, great horses that we captured on TV. We were the first ones to sort of put the Canadian Finals Rodeo on TV and on the big screen right at the event, and uh, so many great cowboys and now they're all getting to be in the hall of fame so that's sort of oh boy and i'm interviewing their kids so oh wow yeah i try and uh stay relevant to them but it, it is interesting but it is neat to see the generational um 
you know, people that love rodeo staying with it and, and carrying on that tradition. There is a lot of that, right? You have rodeo families mm -hmm. and it's a way of life. You see That's that. Right. You yeah. see a lot of those names carry through. Mm -hmm. I, when you said <laughs> talking, capturing the rodeo contestants and their stories, one of the things, just a, a side note that I always get a chuckle out of at the Calgary Stampede, it turns out every year the the winner of the big pot of cash it just seems every year you uh, whoever is interviewing will ask them and what are you going to do with the money <laughs> i'm going to buy cows <laughs> yeah that's and it right. was pretty funny every time we watch anthony and i all sit there and then we say what are they going to say anthony and he says they're going to buy cows yeah. and i love it but how many of them that has made a big difference to them and it has started their ranch operations and, and yeah. got them uh, launched in a career uh, for when rodeo uh, isn't something that they can do every day. And you know, the other interesting thing is uh, in the calf roping, lots of times those guys who win the big check, they will buy that little calf that won them the big check and raise it. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that Isn't neat? that a cool little I piece of trivia? That. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that makes sense. That's yeah. kind of your souvenir. That just shows how much they value the animal. So that animal helped them win a lot. So that's the calf that they'll buy, and it, somehow they make a deal with the stock contractor and end up buying that calf. And of course, that's taking what it you home would when do. it's got a place in the pen. That's what I would do. I I would have never ever thought of that, but that's that's pretty neat. So throughout your shows and throughout your rodeo coverage. Are there, and I'm sure you have handfuls of amazing, amazing stories, is there any one or two stories that really stick out? You know, they all, there's so many, uh, uh, it's sometimes it's hard to pick one, but I think the way I summarize it is I just love those championship moments. You know, when you cover a sport, you get to see the, the psychological challenge of it. You know, I've been to the NFR and seen, um, you know, competitors win a world championship, but then you you watch the other competitors who hit a bad week and what oh. that does to them and how hard that is to, to run for that kind of money and not be able to get anything. And, yeah. and someone like a Lindsay Sears who one year, she I think she hit a barrel every night and then came back a few years later and then won two back-to-back -back world championships, you know? So uh, you just see that triumph and, and, and the drama that's involved and, and I think it's really exciting to be the one there getting that first championship um, you know sensation that they've realized that this goal they've worked on for so long that they've accomplished it and, and what that does to them and, and uh, so that's been fun and, and you know now with the Canadian finals I've worked on the uh, telecast or the radio uh, cast and so sometimes I'm the first one there uh, with the calculations sort of saying you know you've won and uh, we want to try and get the first one so sometimes I have to do a little convincing fortunately we've got a good crew that uh, helps us with the calculating and of course we're not going to do it if we're not pretty sure but right. I've had to convince uh, you know Tyson Durfee or Shane Hanchy, a couple of those guys that like, no, we've done the math. You are the champion. Are you sure? And so to, to be able to share in that moment with them as they find out about it, that's really thrilling. And, and um, you know, those are some of the moments that, that I will sure treasure. I believe it. You know, and even when we're watching the contestants, the winner, be interviewed, you can even feel the realness right there, the shock, the excitement. You can kind of see them going through the phases. Yeah, and sometimes the tears. And so yeah, yeah. Uh, there are, they were giving me a hard time because I was making a few cowboys cry. And I didn't mean to make them cry, but sometimes you just bring up something or ask how their family is and they get teary eyed and then that makes you get teary eyed. Oh. And it's like, oh, it's a bad situation. But you know, cowboys are uh, very real and, and when it is, uh, something that they've dreamed of for so long that uh, yeah, it can be emotional and so sometimes you want to capture that But you don't want to go too far down that road. It's a it's a delicate balance. That's for sure Well, and you know tears are real too. Mm -hmm. That yeah. just shows how much is at stake yeah. when there's a tear coming down You know, you know, it's so important to them, right? Yeah, that's for sure. Oh, that's neat. Wow. You've had some interesting times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great. Yeah. And so many, you just, it's hard to remember them all. And, and some people are wonderful storytellers. Cowboys are themselves. And, and I'm not sure that I'm 
quite there in terms of being able to spin a tail. My brother's a lot better at it than I am, but uh, just just the knowing the people. And I guess that's why I like the, the writing down of it too, because you're, then you're capturing some of those stories that are there and not just in your memory bank, but they're actually there. And that's been the fun part of, of writing and capturing some of those stories too. Wow. What a career. <laughs> it's been fun and still is. And I guess that's, I've been very fortunate. So even though I'm not in, you know, kind of daily throes of broadcasting, but to be able to carry on and, and still be involved in rodeo and, and uh, Canadian finals coming to Red Deer, my own uh, town now, uh, you know, that, that's pretty thrilling to still uh, play a role in the sport and be able to capture some of the stories of the next generation. Neat. I'm having a moment here. I'm oh. going. I'm talking to Diane Finstead. <laughs> no, She's no, it's just you and I camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how neat! How neat! Oh, amazing. So, thank you for sharing all that. I so very much wanted to capture your thoughts and your journey and bring that to our audience at home. I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Many of the individuals out in our audience, they are farmers. And as we all know, uh, farmers are having a, a challenge, right? In addition to trying to do all the hard work that they need to do, they're, they, we are being faced with a lot of scrutiny from the people that don't understand agriculture and how we make our living and how we work really hard to provide safe food. So I couldn't think of a better person to ask about communicating your story. For the individuals at home that are thinking of advocating, that might want to, that might feel they need to, do you have any advice for them on telling your story, their story? Yeah, it's a very different world because uh, when I was in my career uh, in daily radio and television, you know, I was the conduit that, that helped get those stories on yeah. the air and uh, one of the things I always tried to do was get different farmers every time obviously you had your favorites the ones who were always available who would always answer the phone but I always felt it was important to try and get new people and different people and get different perspectives so that was always something that I, I would go on the search for and and I mean obviously if some are involved in associations you'd go back to them but I would always try and find some new ones so now it's it's an interesting turn of events because everyone all of you have some of those same um, tools at your fingertips so you can go directly to the public you don't need right. the big camera and the studio crew and you all the things phone. we had yeah you're it's it, what we used to pack and I mean some of that equipment was heavy and I packed my share of it you know you've got in your in, in, in your phone or yeah. in, in a small camera and so it's, it's a powerful, powerful tool. And again, a tool then that needs to be uh, used carefully. That was the benefit I had with some training about journalism and things that you can say and can't say and, and should use for, right. for guidelines. So yeah. those are important. But, uh, you know, I think the essence of storytelling is just the ones, the farmers that I enjoyed the most were those who were the authentic ones. They would just share their story and just be very real with you. I was always a little suspicious of the ones that, you know, it, it sounded too concocted or, you know, people would have to come because someone else had sent them and it wasn't their story, it was a story they were to a give. A little scripted, yeah, so to yeah. speak. And so if, if you're real and authentic, I think that's, that's a priority in terms of telling a story. And I guess uh, the other thing is, you know, just to, to be available if, if someone asks you for a story. And I, I've heard... Uh, Andrew Campbell, the fresh air farmer, he's great at sharing that. Uh, he yeah, came up through the absolutely. ranks of reporting yes. as well. But I know he said not everyone will be the social media gurus like a farmer, Tim, or right. uh, Jeanette from Farming and Pearls that just have a real natural knack for it. Uh, but you can still support it. And I think the other thing that's important is, you know, you support maybe the social media efforts of your organization or your friends or neighbors uh, by retweeting or adding right. a comment and, and being involved that way. But I think the other thing that's important uh, we don't think about is, is just being able to speak and tell your story if you're at the curling rink or the basketball game or the grocery store and there's somebody looking for help is is to just be willing to help and just sort of uh, not to shy away from people who are looking for real information because you as a farmer and a producer you know what you're talking about yeah. it is your story and so to be willing to share that too so not everyone shares their story in the same way and I think 
we were talking earlier that some people feel pressured yeah. to have to do the social media advocating and that is a powerful tool for some but it's not something that maybe fits for everybody so to find the way that you feel most comfortable with in terms of telling the story and, and uh, being available. Maybe it's it's going to ag in the classroom. Um, you know, maybe it's taking right. the neighbor's kids to the fair. I don't know, but you just find your way of, of uh, thinking about how uh, agriculture comes across to people who aren't as familiar with it. Because there's so many people who haven't had the privilege that we've had of growing up on a farm and, and ha experiencing real farm life and seeing the commitment that people have uh, for producing great, safe food. I love that. That was a, quite a few good points in there. And you know, I think the one that I really liked is there's so much pressure on farmers to advocate, advocate, I should say, just because we're 2%, right? Mm -hmm. And the 98% need to hear from us. That's a lot of pressure. But you know what? Not everybody wants to turn the camera on them and do a video and then put that on social media. And that's okay. That's not... We look back into the times of reporters. Not everybody was a reporter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think with how easy social media is, I think there's that much more pressure for everybody to feel like they need to be that social media star, right? But sometimes it might be as simple as writing a letter to the editor in the local paper if there's something that's not correct or letting people know about an event that's coming up or, um, you know, just maybe sponsoring something uh, for, from your farm at a local 4-H show or, uh, you know, school play or something that just helps people understand that you are a farmer and that you're aware of what's going on in the public. So there are some really creative ways, I think, that you can help, um, you know, be a good representative of agriculture and not in necessarily the same way as everyone else. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you is if you have any words of wisdom for men, women out there that are pursuing their dreams, whether it's farming or non-farming dreams. I know that you were a reporter, I would assume in a time when there was not a lot of female reporters. Can you speak to chasing your dreams and your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. When I started, uh, and, you know, I, I heard later that at the TV station they got some calls that, man, you had every Tom, Dick, and Harry doing the farm news, and now you've even got a girl. Oh, <laughs> really? Uh, it's so, <laughs> doesn't surprise no, me. No, yeah. but at that point, I never got that face-to-face, -face. and I think the fact that I grew up on a farm maybe sort of helped yeah. uh, with that. And so when, again, I get... I guess I hope I was authentic and I had a genuine interest in what they were doing and you know uh, types of farming I didn't know about you know you just ask questions and be really interested in that and, and handle their information carefully and you build that trust um, so I guess you know in terms of my career I have watched a lot of people chase their dreams and I can tell you that for these rodeo contestants for instance chasing their dreams there's a lot of nights uh, going down the highway in a oh. truck that uh, and, and a lot of you know, broken bones and, and uh, uh, time in rehab and there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into chasing their dreams and, and their dreams are a little more focused. You know for myself, did I sit on the tractor and dream that I was going to be interviewing people at, at a major rodeo? I, I, don't, I don't think I ever was that clear on it. I mean maybe okay. there were seeds of things that would be fun to do someday, but I don't think I was ever that clear. And I think I've been blessed. Uh, uh, I think the good Lord had to drag me into some of my opportunities. And But it goes back maybe to that observation and, uh, <clears throat> you know, knowing a good opportunity when I had to make the decision to leave a job after three months and, and leap into something where I hadn't had formal training in TV, didn't know where I was going in Red Deer and, and uh, far, far from home it felt like. And, and uh, that, that took a little gumption. Uh, I yeah. remember my mom tells a story that I just cried when I uh, came back from the job interview because I knew it was too good an opportunity to pass up. And yet I was very um, hesitant to make such a big leap, but I did and it, and it was wonderful. But I, I, it wasn't that I chased after it. It sort of came to me and then I realized that 
I needed to take advantage of that opportunity. So I guess sometimes you have to sort of recognize opportunities that are there and not be afraid um, to go after them if you see them. Observe and then and then be creative. I guess you know we did the show Make and Eat and and you know I was excited and passionate about rodeo and fortunate to have a TV um, station manager who listened to me and we came up with this idea and said, well I think there's a market for videos and all these kinds of things and then took that idea and helped it formulated into business plans so being ready to speak up on, on things that you you're excited about or you, that you're passionate about um, sometimes can lead you to places you wouldn't expect either so I guess those would be my um, I don't know if those are words of wisdom but the things that maybe have really worked for me that hopefully others can learn from in terms of um, getting out there and doing things that that, that might uh, really give them a lot of fulfillment as, as I've been blessed with that is fantastic I think those are amazing <laughs> words of wisdom. And you know what? I think that is the perfect point to finish on. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, reliving a lot of that with you. Thank <laughs> you for asking the questions and for inviting me. This has been actually just such an honor. I Bucket list check, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so on that note, I wanted to thank you on behalf of our audience, on behalf of Impact Farming, on behalf of myself, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.